This is Franklin Rye, and welcome back to Political Spirits. We still stand for the proposition that the left and the right should have a few drinks and talk. Compromise is not a requirement. If those discussions result in us changing or even abandoning our positions, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine too. We just need to talk to each other. In that way, we can unify through speech. And if the discussion becomes a bit heated, at the end of the night, we should still be able to split up the bar tab and be on our way. So what are we going to talk about this week? Well, recent polling of the announced Democratic presidential candidates, as well as the ones that are likely to announce that they are running, indicates that Bernie Sanders is running close behind Joe Biden. In Iowa, for example, 27% of those polled supported Joe Biden and 25% supported Bernie Sanders. That's a de minimis difference, especially given the poll's 4.9% margin of error. FYI, the poll is the Des Moines Register CNN Mediacom poll. Incidentally, the Sanders campaign is also doing quite well in fundraising. It claims to have raised over $6 million in just over 24 hours after announcing his presidential bid. Now, we are all familiar with the fact that Sanders proudly proclaims he's a socialist. And if you're like me, you find it terrifying that a politician with those proclivities is anywhere near being able to get the nomination of one of the two main political parties in the U.S. This is further evidence that as a society we have somehow managed to forget the economic formula which made us the most successful country in the history of the planet. But I'm not going to talk right now about the economic reasons why socialism is doomed to fail. I want to talk about just how extreme Bernie Sanders is when it comes to his support for socialism. Throughout his career, he has been willing to avoid criticism of, and also sometimes provide outright support for, authoritarian socialist regimes including those which are full-on communist. The most recent example is Bernie Sanders' refusal to label Venezuelan leader Nicolas Maduro as a dictator, a refusal which drew criticism from within the Democratic Party. For coverage of this issue, you can look to Politico.com in the February 26, 2019 article by Caitlin Oprisco and the Fox Business article by James DeRosa dated February 27, 2019. But the period when such conduct by Bernie Sanders was the most shocking, and I would argue the most disturbing, was during the Cold War. Bernie Sanders actually honeymooned in the Soviet Union. Bernie Sanders used to actually display the flag of the Soviet Union in his mayoral office in Burlington, Vermont. He hung the Soviet flag and honeymooned in the Soviet Union during the Cold War a time when American military personnel were risking their lives all around the world to try to contain the menace to life, economic, and social freedom which the Soviet Union represented. Any student of history knows that the legacy of communism is death on a catastrophic level. Approximately 100 million corpses resulted from the reigns of various communist regimes during the 20th century, including the Soviet Union the People's Republic of China, North Korea, and Cambodia. For the shocking statistics, one good source is the writings of R.J. Rummel, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Hawaii. At hawaii.edu, you can find various analyses which he prepared regarding democide, which is defined as, quote, the murder of any person or people by a government, including genocide, politicide, and mass murder, close quote. Rummel's studies show that there is a wide range of estimates of the number of democides by each regime, but the Soviet Union had the most of all. The estimate for the Soviet Union is nearly 62 million people killed. Keep in mind that does not include deaths from war. That number is from genocide, politicides, and mass murder. The second most democides are attributed to the People's Republic of China, a total of over 35 million. Nazi Germany comes in third with nearly 21 million. So Bernie Sanders chose to honeymoon in a country which committed nearly three times as many genocides, politicides, and mass murders as Nazi Germany. 
Bernie Sanders chose to fly in his mayoral office the flag of a country which committed nearly three times as many genocides, politicides, and mass murders as Nazi Germany. But the evidence of Bernie Sanders' love of the Soviet Union doesn't end there. Bernie Sanders chose to work on a kibbutz, a farming commune in Israel in the 1960s. As the New York Times noted on February 5, 2016, in an article by Stephen Erlanger, for years the location and identity of the kibbutz was unclear. But eventually, a search of the archives of the Israeli newspaper Haaretz confirmed it was Kibbutz Shar Hamakim, near Haifa, and that Sanders was there as a guest of the Hashemer Heitzer youth movement. The New York Times article notes that the kibbutz that Bernie Sanders attended, quote, saw the Soviet Union as a model and often flew the red flag at outdoor events, close quote. As noted by Thomas Lifson in American Thinker on February 5, 2016, in an article entitled Bernie Sanders' 1963 Stay at a Stalinist Kibbutz, the kibbutz at which Bernie stayed was part of the, quote, communist organizational support system dedicated to the triumph of communism under the leadership of the Soviet Union, close quote. He notes that the founder of the kibbutz, Yaakov Hazan, Quote, described the USSR as a second homeland, close quote. He also quoted the founder's writings upon the death of Stalin. He notes that upon Stalin's death, the founder of the kibbutz that Sanders attended wrote, quote, To hear of the terrible tragedy that has befallen the nations of the Soviet Union, the world proletariat, and all of progressive mankind, upon the death of the great leader and extolled commander, Joseph Vasarianovich Stalin, we lower our flag in grief in memory of the great revolutionary fighter, architect of socialist construction, and leader of the world's peace movement. His huge historical achievements will guide generations in their march towards the reign of socialism and communism the world over. Close quote. The article notes further that the newspaper of the movement which founded the commune ran an article at the time of Stalin's death which was titled, The Progressive World Mourns the Death of J.V. Stalin. Bernie Sanders chose to live in a kibbutz founded and run by a movement which supported Stalin, a brutal communist dictator, a mass murderer on an unprecedented scale. America fought the Soviet Union in the Cold War for decades, we spent untold billions of dollars and thousands of members of the armed services and the clandestine services of the United States and its allies gave their lives to stop the spread of communism by the Soviet Union, eventually winning the Cold War when the Soviet regime collapsed in 1991. To think that one of the leading candidates for the Democratic Party presidential nomination is a supporter of the Soviet Union who visited the country on his honeymoon who flew its flag in his mayoral office and who chose to live in a commune run by an organization which celebrated communism and whose founder and newspaper mourned the loss of what they contended to be a great man when Joseph Stalin, a mass-murdering communist dictator, died, is disgusting as the son of a military veteran who served for 21 years in the Cold War I am aghast at the possibility that Bernie Sanders could ever rise to the highest office in the land. I can't even imagine how this man, Bernie Sanders, could ever be viewed by anyone as an acceptable commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the United States of America. I can't even imagine how this man, Bernie Sanders, could ever be viewed as an acceptable leader of the most powerful country in the history of the world benefiting from the most powerful economy, a capitalist economy, in the history of the world. If the security clearance investigation was actually conducted with due diligence, how on earth could Bernie Sanders ever actually pass the background check for the highest level security clearance, which would of course be what the president would require? I understand if he were to somehow win the Democrat nomination, and then the general election, that he would have to get the clearance. But absent that hopefully impossible development, could a properly conducted background check ever approve him for such a high-level clearance? Surely not. Well, perhaps you think that it doesn't matter because the Soviet Union no longer exists. 
But Bernie's love affair with communist regimes isn't limited to the Soviet Union. At the invitation of the communist regime in Nicaragua, Bernie Sanders spoke at its seventh anniversary in 1985, where he bashed the United States. Go to the Fox News Online edition from February 22 in an article by Adam Shaw entitled, Vintage Bernie Footage Shows Now Presidential Candidate Praising Breadlines, Communist Nations, for some eye-opening videos of Bernie Sanders, among other things, praising breadlines and food rationing and chastising a television station for referring to the regime of Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua as Marxist. Bernie's position was that it should be referred to as democratically elected, not as Marxist. Sanders raised that objection and tried to pressure the television station not to refer to the regime as Marxist, even though Ortega was and is commonly recognized as a Marxist revolutionary, at least in the time period in question. Interestingly, and perhaps not surprisingly, Ortega is now widely recognized as an authoritarian and is often described as having abandoned his more left-wing roots in pursuit of power. What a surprise. Sanders' support for communist dictator Fidel Castro was also well documented, including videos in which he noted that Fidel Castro had totally transformed Cuban society and he complimented Castro's achievements on education and health care. As explained in an article at Slate.com by Leon Cross, dated February 20, 2019, and entitled Sanders Has a Soft Spot for Latin American Strongmen, CNN's Anderson Cooper, in light of Sanders' comments regarding Castro, asked Sanders whether Castro's revolution had actually benefited the Cuban people. Sanders avoided the question, and quote, when Cooper tried to get a straight answer, Sanders promptly accused him of red-baiting and repeated his condemnation-slash-praise routine of the Castro government. Close quote. Think for a moment about what Bernie Sanders' history shows. It shows that he has a track record with support for communism and communist regimes. It shows he has a willingness to turn a blind eye, limit or avoid criticism of strongman regimes, if they further his extreme leftist views. Now think for a moment about one hot-button proposal which is being advanced by leftists in the Democratic Party right now. The Green New Deal, which I've talked about previously on this podcast, has 89 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives. If the act were somehow passed and what it sets out was actually done, it would entail a cost of up to $93 trillion over 10 years, and likely destroy the economy and burden us with extreme inflation as a result of printing money to cover the cost. It's a recipe for an absolutely jaw-dropping expansion of government power in the United States. Now think about Bernie Sanders' love affair with the communist strongmen in that context. Think about him choosing to live in a kibbutz which celebrated Stalin, a communist mass murderer. Think about his refusal to label Venezuelan strongman Nicolas Maduro a dictator. Think about his praise of Fidel Castro and Nicaraguan authoritarian Daniel Ortega. The Green New Deal would be an absolute nightmare for this country. It's hard to imagine anything that would be worse. Now think about if we had Bernie Sanders as a president able to take advantage of that dramatic increase in government power resulting from the Green New Deal if it ever took effect. That's a thought almost too horrible to contemplate. I don't believe the Green New Deal will be passed. I don't believe Bernie Sanders will receive the Democrat nomination for president. If by some chance he does, I believe he'll be handily defeated by Donald Trump. But the bottom line is that we shouldn't even be in a position where we have to worry about it. The fact that 25% of Democrats being polled express support for Bernie Sanders is terrifying. That's why, as I've said before, if the Democrat Party nominates Bernie Sanders or another leftist, the best thing that could happen for the country and for the Democrat Party would be for the Democrat nominee to be defeated in a landslide. Next topic.
two quick segments. Just like last week, I'm going to end with a couple of quick segments. There's no need to separate them because they won't each be long enough. The first is another instance of an attack on someone for wearing a Trump hat. In this case, it wasn't a violent physical attack, but rather a Martin County, Florida school bus aide pulled a Trump hat off a boy's head on the school bus. Go to WPBF.com for coverage dated March 8, 2019 regarding the incident. The student whose hat was pulled off his head was 14 years old. It was apparently hat day at the school, and the student had donated a dollar to charity to be able to wear a hat. The school bus aide later said she didn't realize it was hat day. She also said she gently removed the hat from the student's head. The family says she ripped it off his head. Watch and listen to the video on the site. In particular, listen to the tone of the school bus aide. Listen to how she angrily tells the student multiple times to, quote, take that hat off, close quote. Now, the video doesn't show her actually taking it off his head, but frankly, in light of the anger in her voice, it seems to me that the description of her ripping the hat off his head is more likely to be true than her description that she gently removed it from his head. The other thing that the anger in her voice shows is that she is righteously indignant that any student would dare to wear a Trump hat. This is another example of opposition to a political figure with whom you disagree having become so extreme that it becomes a form of bigotry. As we've discussed on previous podcasts, bigotry is defined as, quote, intolerance toward those who hold different opinions from oneself, close quote. This ridiculous treatment of the act of wearing a Donald Trump hat as being some sort of racism or, as I previously discussed, being characterized as the equivalent of wearing a swastika has to stop. Wearing a Donald Trump hat is nothing more than supporting the current president of the United States and presumably his political policies. There need to be severe consequences for the school bus aid. Will there be? I don't know but I'm skeptical. I'll keep you up to date. As you know from prior podcast episodes, I do not support allowing transgender females who are biologically males to compete against biological females in athletic events which are specifically designated as female events. The increased lung capacity, strength, size, and speed which males typically possess make it fundamentally unfair to allow such competition unless, of course, the competition is open to both sexes. Tennis legend Martina Navratilova recently came out and expressed essentially exactly the same position, including stating that biological men who are transgender women competing against biological females is, in essence, cheating. I agree with her completely. Not surprisingly, in light of the way in which the left-wing outrage mob responds in this country, Martina was promptly removed from the board of an organization which supports gay rights in sports. There are some positive developments occurring on this point, including that additional athletes have started to add their voices to Martina's. For example, Sharon Davies, a silver medalist in the 1980 Summer Olympics, tweeted her support for Martina's position and promptly received a backlash. She said, quote, I have nothing against anyone who wishes to be transgender. However, I believe there's a fundamental difference between the binary sex you are born with and the gender you may identify as. To protect women's sport, those with the male sex advantage should not be able to compete in women's sport. She's absolutely right. In an interview after releasing the tweet, she said that she had spoken to many other female athletes and that they all feel the same as she does. She went on to explain that those who are currently competing are in, quote, a very difficult predicament when they can't speak out, close quote. She went further, quote, it may be false to the people who were competing in the past who would understand the predicament that is being faced at the moment to try to create a debate and try to explain how we feel there needs to be a fair and level playing field, close quote. Basically, she's proposing that we have a discussion. Sounds good to me. Apparently, that isn't how it struck transgender cyclist Rachel McKinnon, who I've talked about previously when addressing this issue. She labeled Davies a transphobe and said that she was engaging in hate speech. We've seen this reaction before. 
It seems to happen nearly every time. McKinnon is reacting the way the left-wing outrage mob almost always reacts, by calling her opponent some sort of phobe and labeling her statements hate speech. I'm sick of it. We should all be sick of it. We need to be able to have discussions in this country. If we can't, why are we pretending that we're free? I believe there's an absolute enormous mass of people who feel as I do on the transgender athletes issue, but they are staying silent for fear of the left-wing mob. That has to change. We have to speak up. It's not just our right, it's our duty. I look forward to speaking up to you next week when I release the next episode of Political Spirits. Until then, be sure to tell your friends about Political Spirits and follow me on Twitter at Franklin Rye. This is Franklin Rye. Thank you for listening.